when you, when you look at landscaping, uh, I always looked at it from the perspective of what can I learn from this uh, as, as a spiritual man? And there's always lessons to be learned. Uh, one of the lessons I learned uh, happened one day when I was uh, trimming a tree. Uh, and I couldn't get my chainsaw into the uh, tight area of the branch work that I needed to take it out. So I, I had to go get a big bow saw, like a, uh, not, a not a complete bow, but a, the old school jagged teeth offset, it can cut through steel. So I grabbed my trusty bow saw uh, and I walked over to the branch uh, and I knew the drill. I had to cut it really clean and I had to use all my back, you know, pulling on this thing. I had to get my feet planted to do it. Uh, and I'd done this before many times. So I, you know, I went to work and the, and the branch in question, very big branch, but it looked healthy. A lot of greenery, except look, look, well, externally looked fine. It was just, I needed to prune it to uh, thin the plant out some. So uh, I began to, to trim and as I began to pull on that saw as hard as I could uh, I was you know left-handed so I'm pulling like this uh, and within a few seconds I hit the interior core of the branch which totally rotted totally couldn't see that and all of a sudden my saw went straight through that thing and full speed hit me in my leg it was painful to the point where I couldn't speak ever had pain like that just took your breath away uh, I had 27 puncture wounds down to the bone, like kneecap, shin, where there's no flesh. Uh, why couldn't God have put some more flesh down there for things like this? And it was, I was just absolutely stunned. I didn't see any blood at first, and then I did. 27 holes appeared. I counted them. Uh, now, that day, I was basically rescued because uh, with me was uh, Liz's dad, before he passed away, uh, a Navy corpsman who had spent two years in Vietnam in a surgical tent in a forward position, he had seen it all. To him, this was like, it's not a problem. I'm bleeding out, it's not a problem. Uh, and so he helped me that day come to health and wholeness. Um, Navy corpsman here, any Navy corpsman here? Go Navy. No? Go Navy, thank you. He's trying to help, and he was attached to Marines, so go Marines. Yeah, not that God doesn't love the other groups, but we're just talking about these two today. Yeah. I have to preface these things now because I get email. You know, it's like, hey, what about that? Yeah, anyway. What has that got you to teach you about spiritual living? Uh, everything. Because externally, uh, you as a Christian can look like you have got it all together. And you can deceive anybody and everybody around you. You can go to Bible studies. You can say all the right words. Uh, you, can, you can whatever. Serve in the children's department. Whatever. And you externally can look to other people like I, you've got it going on. Internally, you know that there's rot that there is some kind of rot that has taken place in your life, some sin that you have committed, you have not come clean of that sin, and it, like the disease in that branch, is eaten away at the interior of your spiritual life, where you don't really have joy, and you know it, and you really don't have peace, and you know it, because well, God's continually convicting you over the rot, the disease. And, and when we look at that kind of situation, can we all relate because we're all born with clay feet? And even when we come to know Christ the Savior, uh, then we have to take our high position in Jesus and then take our daily walk and then match the two. And so that's why you have all the commandments in the New Testament to do this, don't do that. It's to take your life as a Christian and align it with your position in Christ. That, that's hard to do because we have a will. What happens when your willful sin gets in the way and uh, you allow disease into your life and that disease is not... Uh, confess that sin and you compromise your spiritual walk uh, this is uh, the story of David's life like what happens when this happens when you compromise your spiritual walk because Psalm 51 is about his compromise if you read uh, the psalm and you read the header in it which is not a verse in the English text but it's a verse 1 in the Hebrew text what does it tell you about the historical setting of this book it says this particular song uh, was written uh, when the prophet Nathan came to, to David after he had gone into Bathsheba. See, this man with a heart after God, who truly loved God and followed hard after him, wrote many of our Psalms, compromised on one thing, and it was called what? Lust. Lust led to adultery, adultery led to lying, lying led to murder, etc. The disease in his life compromised his life. And so Psalm 51 is about uh, David's uh, agonizing path back to a place of great peace with God, which is when you sin willfully against God and you don't confess it, he starts working overtime on you, as you know, because he loves you. It, when you have a situation like that in your life right now, and I don't even have to tell you, the Spirit's already told you. He's already got his finger on it. He's already told you, you know about that? Uh, that needs to be dealt with before the cross of Christ as a, as a child of God. But as we get into what David uh, is going to teach us here about this, I want to 
tell you three things up front. Number one, if that's a description of your life, like the branch, outwardly you look great, inwardly you know there's compromise, and there's disease there, uh, three things. Number one, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Why? Because uh, your heavenly father is a loving, gracious, merciful, heavy. he's holy, but he's loving. Uh, and he always stands ready to put you from the road of your personal ruin to restoration. He's always there. He loves you. Number two, uh, understand that despite what the raspy voice of the devil says in your ear, uh, there's no sin greater than his grace. Did you hear me? The devil will come to you. And I know his raspy voice because I've heard it. You know what I'm talking about? You're nothing. Look what you did. There's no recovery from this. Wait till people find out. See, this is not the voice of the Spirit. So when that little raspy voice comes to you because of your sin, you realize that, that no matter what that sin is, there's the grace greater for that. You just have to avail yourself of the grace. There's an old hymn written back in the mid-1800s by a lady named Julia Johnson. Uh, great words about God's grace. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there, that's where the blood of the Lamb was spilt. I love the refrain. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all of our sin. So don't listen to the devil. If the, you got that rot going on in the core of your being, uh, today's the day to come clean. Number three, and this is not my sermon. This is an introduction. You still with me? Third, learn from David. Learn from a wise man who committed a, a series of major sins. Learn from his life. That's why he wrote this psalm. Uh, learn what it means to be a, a saint that loves God, but who has willfully walked away from God, and learn from him the path back. And also realize the, the dangerous nature of sin. Because when he committed this sin with Bathsheba, it didn't just lead to one sin, it led to many sins. In fact, if you take the Ten Commandments, he broke the last five with her. What are those Ten Commandments? Number six, you shall not commit murder. What did he do? Well, in order for me to get her, I got to get rid of him. His name? Uriah. A soldier in his, in his army. I got to get rid of this. I got to put him in a forward position. That's a hot position. So he gets taken out, and then I can really have her. Commandment number six. Commandment number seven. You shall not commit adultery. You know, and what did Jesus say about adultery? It's not just the action of adultery. It's the lust of thinking of adultery. Totally different measurement. He actually followed through on the lust because from what we know of the topography of, of a Jerusalem where his palace was, and if you come with me to Israel, when we go now because of COVID, it's moved us to 2095, I think, I, uh, 2022, I will take you to where the palace of David used to be. And you can see it's on, a, it's on a hill. And from his high palace, he could have seen most of the surrounding dwellings around him. He could have easily seen her on a cool of an evening because they walked on the top of their roofs. He could have easily looked down into her courtyards and seen her taking a ritual bath. And that lust led to, I think I'll invite her over for dinner. And what could that hurt, etc. And it went from there. Commandment number seven, don't commit adultery. He did that. Commandment number eight, you shall not steal. What did he steal? What was not his? What was not his? Connect the dots. Well, Bathsheba wasn't his wife. He stole her from Uriah. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Did he lie? like most sinners do, to rationalize and cover his sin. Uh, commandment number 10, you shall, it's the internal one. You can say, yeah, I kept all the others. It's the last one that's a tough one. You shall not covet. What did he do? He coveted everything about her and lost all perspective. Psalm 51 is his journey back. Psalm thir uh, 51 uh, generates a hermeneutical question, which is the question of, of those who have allowed that disease into your life, that sin, because of that willful sin you have committed like David. Here's the question that we're going to spend two Sundays pondering. How can I, as a Christian, secure inner peace through a divine pardon? It's primarily written to Christians. Now, it is applicable to a non-Christian, as we're going to see. But it's first and foremost about a Christian finding their way back to that intimate relationship. So if you've, if you've lost that intimate relationship, that you are like that branch in my analogy, uh, today, today's the day to find restoration. How do you do that? Two things. Number one, Psalm 51 verses 1 and 2 says you must plead. You must plead. He says uh, in the opening of the Hebrew text, verse 1, this is for the choir director because they sang this song at church. 
He says, this is a psalm of David. When was it written? Well, when David the prophet came to him and after he had gone into Bathsheba. Of course, God is using euphemistic language there to cover up the heinous nature of what he did. Uh, apart from what our culture says, uh, the Torah in Numbers uh, chapter 32, verse 23 is most, most appropriate. What does it say there? It says, be sure that your sin will do what? Find you out. You know, whatever it is that you did, you might have covered it up well from your parents, your boyfriend, your aunts, uncles, guys in your unit. You know, what happens while you're deployed stays while you're deployed. Mm hmm Yeah. Uh, not the case. God says, uh, I'm holy, and I know what you do. Be sure your sin will find you out. See, Dave, David temporarily got away with his sin. However, God, who knew what he had done in secret, um, has many ways of convicting the saint of said sin. So, as we're going to see, not only was David convicted in the internal man of his sin, and that gave him no rest, as we shall see, till he came to rest at the feet of God, uh, he had a prophet come to him named Nathan. Uh, Natan in, in uh, Hebrew means a gift. Natan El means a gift of God. And the gift came in an unusual way, because the gift, this godly man, was in confrontation. That God gave Nathan... The, the gift of the insight into uh, Dath David's life to say, the king has sinned, these are his sins, you go confront him. See, it was that confrontation that coincided with the internal conviction of the Holy Spirit that led to a point of confession and repentance. But oh, how hard it is sometimes to get a saint to repent because of that will. Maybe you have a Nathan in your life who's come to you and he's confronted you and you've blown Nathan off. That's not a wise thing to do. But God has many ways to get your attention. David uh, says, uh, well, Nathan got my attention. Uh, and when Nathan got my attention, he said, here's the things I asked of God. So pay attention to the language here because they're, they're, in Hebrew, they're commands. But they're a command from a lesser, David, a human, to God who's greater, God, the infinite one. What does he ask for? What's he say? God, I need you to be gracious to me. Oh, God. What kind of grace? Well, the kind that's according to your loving kindness. We'll just stop right there. God, I, I need you in my situation to be gracious to me. The Hebrew word means give me something I don't deserve. You're holy. I have sinned big time. I, I'm throwing myself all over your grace. I need your grace. Do, give this to me, which I don't deserve. And, he, and then he calls him many names of God. He calls him, O God, O Elohim. The very first word of God in the Old Testament is Elohim. Who's he? He's the creator. See, he looks at an interior sin that he has, he has committed that has led to other sins externally. And he says, you know, the help I need is from on high. It's from the creator who made me. And I need you to reach down from heaven and do in my heart what I can't do for myself. I need grace. And he said, I need the kind of grace that's according to your loving kindness. Uh, loving kindness uh, in Hebrew, the word is chesed. And it means loyal love. And it's used all throughout the Old Testament. When people ever say, uh, you know, it doesn't, we don't see a loving God in the Old Testament, you have not read the Old Testament. Because chesed, God's loyal love is everywhere. It's everywhere. What does this mean? He says, God, I need you to be gracious according to the loyalty that I know that you have for your people, your children. See, what does that mean? Well, it means when you sin, and you sin again, and then you sin again, you have broken that intimate relationship, but who has moved, God or you? You did. Those people who tell me, I just feel like God is not part of my life anymore. I just feel like he's left me alone. Who has moved? You did. God never moves. Why? Because he's, he's loyal in his love for you. So you can come to him. So when you come back to God, your plea is, God, I recognize your character is gracious. Be gracious to me, a sinner. I need that poured out on me, and I know you're loyal. Forgive me for being disloyal. So when you are disloyal, he's always loyal to take you back. What does he want from God? Notice the verbs. He wants uh, to d denote these uh, verbs, most importantly, because this is the way back in your plea. He says, God, I want you to do, first thing, blot out my transgressions. Blot them out. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And third thing, cleanse me from my sin. Blot. What this means is, uh, in ancient use of the Hebrew here, the word for blot re refers to taking uh, a device in their day and blotting something out of a ledger. So David says, God, I know you're keeping track of my sinful activities. And by New Testament terminology, um, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, it's for believers. Heaven and hell is not in, in balance, uh, in question. What is in question when we stand before God as his children is, how well did you serve me? 
I will reward you accordingly. How well did you serve me? That's 1 Corinthians 3. Read it. 2 Corinthians 5.10 also talks about it. Let's do assorted parables. He says, God, I know you're keeping track when, to reward me one day for obedience or disobedience, but I have a whole boatload of disobedience. I need you to blot it out as if it's not there. Number two, he says, I need to wash, you need to wash me thoroughly. Uh, it doesn't take a Hebrew scholar to figure out what that means. It's an ancient laundry term that denotes kneading. Uh, when I used to go to South Carolina back in the 60s and 70s to see my dad's mom, my grandma, uh, and uh, you know, when you're a kid and you don't know your grandma's poor, I didn't know she was poor until I was in my 20s and went back uh, there um, to see her one last time before she died. But when I was a kid, I remember the washing machine out on the back porch, no electricity, and it was a crank, and it had one of those kneading racks. Remember those? If you remember those, you're old like me. If you don't, you're like, what is this guy talking about? It's like over my head. Uh, well, it was, a, it was before the electricity for those. And it took my grandma with uh, 10 daughters and one son and a husband a lot of work to wash all those clothes. Imagine a stain on clothing. What do you want to happen in our day and age? You reach up for your trusty little sprays, don't you? I do when I help, Liz. And sometimes it takes a couple of different ones, doesn't it? I'm spraying this, a little bit of this. I got this out. I got this at Home Depot. It's on my shop. I went and grabbed that. I've actually done this, smeared that on there. Yeah, I got some, yeah. There's some stuff I found that really works good. My wife freaked out and it worked. Um, and no holes. But anyway, back to my sermon. You want to get the spot out, don't you? When you have compromised at the most intimate level with God and you know it because the Spirit's telling you right now, what do you want? Blot that sin out as if it never was and wash this stain from my life from what I've done. Third, what does he want? Well, the third one refers to the process of smelting. Cleanse me from my sin. What he's saying is, God, my life used to be a precious, beautiful thing as a wonderful metal before you, wonderful but then I encumbered it with all of this dross. And try as I may, I, I can't get rid of the dross. It just keeps multiplying. Would you please just drop me into your smelter and just burn all that stuff out of there? So he says, God, you know, if the blotting doesn't work, then, then please move, move to the laundry and, and wash me clean. How much of me does he want washed? All of me. It's contaminated, all of me. And if that doesn't work, God, then drop me into the discipline uh, of whatever it's gonna take to, to just burn this dross out of my life so I'm free from this sin. That's what the, the child of God wants, freedom from that. He says, let me get real about my sin. He, per, per, he looks at his sin from three perspectives. He uses three different Hebrew words. He says, uh, uh, you know, blot out my transgressions. Pesha in Hebrew is the word for open rebellion. Do you have a child? No children here? Were you a child? Whenever does someone raise a child and they always do exactly what they're supposed to, right? Did you do exactly what your parents said? Because whenever they gave the great, your, say your dad was Moses and he gave the dictate, whatever it was, did you always do it exactly? Uh, no, well, no. My parents told me after being in my last church for almost 20 years, they told me one day, we learned more about you as our son from your sermons than we ever knew. Because <laughs> I used myself in sermons. And after service, my dad would go, you, you did that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's called open rebellion. Uh, when I was in junior high, we always went to this church camp uh, in the mountains outside of San Diego, and I loved this church camp. I think it was called Two Lakes at the time. It was a big dam and a, and a big lake there. We, it was awesome. And so for you know, my upbringing, we go to this camp in elementary school and junior high, and we, we knew this camp well. So my best friend, Donnie Sundstrom, who eventually went to work for the CIA during the Cold War, uh, we were buds. His dad uh, was the manager of the Kenworth plant in Mexicali, Mexico. Great family, godly family. Went to church together. Donna and I were always like pushing the edge. So we went to the church camp. It's our eighth grade year. It's, it's like the final time. And we knew all the hillsides very well from all of our exploring and free time. And we knew where the perimeter fence was. Miles out there was a barbed wire fence. And on it, we knew there was a sign. And that sign said, no trespassing. And so we figured, okay, this, this time we are going to the outer perimeter at free time. We're coming to that fence. We've never been over there before. We're all that mosquitoes, no telling what's over there. Let's go do it. So we went over there at free time, hiked way out there off into the mountains, got to that fence, moved the barbed wire, sn snuck through, started walking through the mesquite, came to a clearing. Yeah, there was a bull. And I'm not, I'm not lying. There was a bull, a large bull. 
like probably over 100 pounds, like maybe 2,000 pounds, snorting, standing off at the distance of this clearing. Donnie's in red. He's <laughs> <laughs> doing the Christian thing. No, I turn around, I see this bull, I freeze. Donnie didn't. He was, he was the track star. He was gone. He, and he, whenever we played dodgeball as kids, I mean, you could never hit him. He's like a ghost. He was so nimble, dumble jointed, it could miss all your best shots. He cleared that barbed wire fence like there was no fence. And I'm like, I got my kids on, remember kids? Those increased your speed like by about 10 miles an hour. I had kids on, those things, I was burning up that field, running for that fence. I, I dove over that fence, just like Donnie did. And we took off running, I don't even know what happened to the bull. What did the sign say? No Thank you. No trespassing. What does the law say? If it says no trespassing, it's probably there for a reason. You should not do that. It's like at SeaWorld down in Florida, there's a sign next to the dolphin pool which says, do not put your hair, finger in the dolphin's air hole. Why? Because someone's done that. See? Obey the law. Obey the law. I know from experience what Pesha is all about. It's open rebellion. He, got, he says, God, you, you need to blot this out of me. Number two, I need you to deal with my iniquity. This, is, this means distortion. It's distorting what is true. It's used in a literal fashion in Psalm 38, verse 7, to denote the pain that a woman goes through in childbirth. Because pain distorts her body, does it not? Men, don't say anything. Ladies, does not pain distort your body? Because you can't control it. I mean, the baby's coming. It's going to be awesome. But this pain is happening. And he says, God, my sin is, is kind of like that. It's a total distortion of who I want to be. You know, take that out of my life. Blot it out of my life. And he says, uh, and, and as for my sin, the big Hebrew word for sin, hata, that's a military term. It used originally uh, from men on a firing line with bows and arrows, learning how to shoot an arrow at a target. And when you miss the target, you had committed, according to the, uh, you know, the instructor, whoever he was, a drill instructor, whoever on the firing line, he would tell you that you had committed hata. You missed the target. You gotta shoot again. That became the great word of sin because here God says, this is how I want you to live and you purposely miss the target. That's sin. David says, God, I need you to deal with all of that in my life because that's exactly what I've done, all three of them. All three of them. Ezekiel chapter 18 tells us how God feels about it when we sin. It says uh, in verse 31, cast away from you, God speaking to Israel, all of your transgressions which you have committed uh, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? God says, for I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, I, God says, I give you some advice. Turn, and you're going to find life. Repent. Repent. He does not want to judge the child as you will a child who, who, who is disobedient. He wants to bless you. But he wants you to get that new heart of love with him again. And that comes through submitting yourself to confession, a plea. And if you don't know Christ as your Savior, that positional holiness that you get comes the minute you look at yourself and say, I am a sinner who needs the Savior. And like all the ones baptized today, that moment of faith, that, that Lord said, I will wash your sin clean and make you a new child. I know that's true. Second Corinthians 5.17, I had to memorize it when I was a new believer back in 1967. What does it say? Therefore, if anyone, even me as a nine-year-old at the time, is in Christ, who is he? New creation. Old things, the old you is passed away. Behold, all the things have become new. See, when you come to know Christ, the old you is gone, covered by the blood of Christ. The new you is now here. The only problem is the new you has a will. And the problem is matching your will with what the will of God is and being an obedient child. See, David wasn't obedient. So how did he find his way back to restoration? A plea. God, here's my plea. Is that your plea? Have you given God a plea? Number two, you must be precise. You must be very precise. Verses three to five. He says, uh, God, I'm gonna own my, my sin. I'm not gonna blame it on Bathsheba. I'm gonna blame it on myself. He says, for I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. He says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. I, I have no argument against you, God. I'm owning up to my sin. He's very precise. He says, my sin is ever before me. What does that mean? He couldn't escape the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You, can, you cannot. You can, you can deceive me, the elder council, your best friends, your parents, whoever are your Christian friends at college, you can deceive them all day long. You cannot see, deceive the spirit of God who loves you 
and he'll put his finger on that sin, and no matter where you go, he will be reaching down and tapping you on the shoulder and saying, what were you thinking? Why in the world did you do that? Why is he doing that? Well, to get you to come clean. Spurgeon, years ago, Charles Spurgeon, a great preacher in England, uh, had a sermon on this passage. You should read it sometime. It's very profound. He says uh, these words about this concept of not being able to escape uh, God's voice. He says, to an awakened conscience, pain on account of sin is not transient and occasional, but intense and permanent. And this is no sign of divine wrath, but rather a sure preface of abounding favor. Why is God not turning you loose? Well, because he loves you. And just like a father would go after a daughter or a son, he said, I I love you enough to tell you that was wicked. Will you please come back to me? What's the way from ruination to restoration? Starts with a plea. And then it comes down to specifics. You cannot fake God. Well, you know, Lord, there was that thing I did when I was in Iraq. Yeah. And the wife didn't know about it. Yeah. God's like, "Uh, no, I need to know specifically. I want to hear it. What'd you do? What'd you do? Be specific. I'm not going to list what sins you could possibly commit because I'm sure God has already helped you right now where you're seated. He helped me earlier in the week. It's like, you know, you can't deceive God. Well, then God, why do I need to come clean over? Because remember, if you don't come clean, then that sin's like that disease inside the branch. It eats it, destroys it. But if you can't come clean of that sin and confess that sin, well, he's ready to forgive sin. First John 1, 9. I also had to memorize that as a new Christian. What does it say? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And then do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all of it. Boy, I've used that prayer many times in my life because God is gracious, but you got to come clean with specifics. David says, uh, God, let me get real with you and just explain to you that I really understand like where my sin came from. He says, verse five, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. He said, I can't look at like my culture does on my world to say, well, you're just a product of your environment and it's not your problem and et cetera. No, he says, no, 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 no. I realize that my sin problem started when my parents conceived me. And just as a side note, this is why I'm pro-life. Why? At the moment of conception, God sees him as an individual man he made who is a sinner who needs a savior. That's a whole nother sermon series. But he says, God, I, I realize my sin problem started there. If you don't understand that, just go back and read the story of Adam, Eve, and the garden, and then jump over from chapter 3 uh, of Genesis to Romans 5, 12 to 21, where Paul waxes eloquent on how Adam's sin was passed down to all of us. That that first Adam blew it, but the second Adam, Jesus, did a greater work because he came and was sinless and then went to the cross for our sin. David says, Lord, Lord I understand that my whole being is permeated with sin. That's why I need you to reach down as the creator God and cleanse me and help me. I need help. Maybe that's your prayer today.